now uh, teaching a series on doctrine and uh, from the perspective of the apostles and we're going to continue on in that series until I feel like uh, the Lord directs me elsewhere but uh, for today we're going to pick up on a subject that is uh, very important, and um, I don't think that we will finish all of this in one service. We might, but I doubt it, and so I'm really not pushing myself to even do that. And um, so we want to turn this morning to the book of Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start reading with verse number 1, and... um, We'll say it is good to be home, and I do appreciate uh, all of the prayers that went up for me, especially while we were gone. I do appreciate it very, very, very much, and um, thank God I am feeling much better, and uh, uh, ready to ready to preach a little bit this morning. Praise God. Amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise God. We we want to talk today with the help of the Lord about the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. This is, um, this is an important subject and, uh, I am afraid not enough emphasis is being put on it in the church world today, but it is a very, very important topic. And so as I've been doing in all of this series, I'm going to try to break it down as simply as I can. Um, that's just I feel like it's the best way to approach these kinds of subjects and um, and make them as simple and as easy to understand as possible. Uh, I don't want anybody to to um, misunderstand a topic as important as this one. Praise God. Amen. And so we're going to talk about the Holy Ghost for a while this morning. Would you put your Bibles down? Let's lift our hands and lift our hearts and lift our voices to the Lord right now. Let's ask him to speak to us, everybody. Let's talk to the Lord together. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Everyone say the Holy Ghost. And I, I know and, and understand that in, uh, in so much of Christianity today, uh, the term Holy Ghost has become somewhat archaic. Uh, it's considered old-fashioned. Most people today refer to the Holy Spirit, and um, the fact of the matter is the Greek word can be translated either spirit or ghost. There is a reason why I, for one, uh, like the fact that our King James Bible 
translates this word in most cases as ghost. Uh, I, I like that. I like that um, terminology. I like uh, that that particular phrase to describe what we're talking about. Because we understand uh, when we think of a ghost, we, we think of the spirit of one who has departed. Amen. That's, that's the way we would define a ghost. And we are talking today about the Holy Ghost. It is the spirit of one who has departed. Amen. In fact, not just anyone who has departed, but the Holy One. The Holy One, a man that has departed from the face of the earth and has come back to us, a man. And uh, let me, and, and I, I don't have time to to deal with this in detail today. Uh, I would just say to our guests, if you're interested, uh, stop by the sound booth. We'll be glad to provide you with um, recordings when I taught on uh, uh, the Godhead, but let me let me just address the fact that that uh, the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Trinity, because it's not even a person. It's not the Holy Person. It's the Holy Spirit, and there is a difference between a person and a spirit. And Jesus himself addressed this in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 39. Jesus delineated for us the difference between a person and a spirit. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit, for a spirit hath not does flesh not have flesh and bones, and bones as you, as you see me have. Now, uh, the, the, the disciples were afraid. This was after the resurrection. Jesus appeared to them, and, and they thought that a ghost had come into the room. And Jesus said, no, 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 touch me. See, I'm not a spirit. I'm a person. Amen. And there's a difference between a person and a spirit. Amen. A, 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 a spirit is not limited Physically, the way a person is. A person cannot be omnipresent. A person cannot be everywhere at the same time. Amen. But a spirit can. And that's why it's important that we understand that we don't try to put the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost into some kind of theological box and identify this spirit as a person. Because that's not at all what it is. Now, this this thing we call the Holy Ghost uh, is also called the Spirit of God. It is called the Spirit of Christ. There's no difference. Let's let's look here. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18. John 14, verses 16 through 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Now now look, these three verses are extremely important in what I just said. We need to understand, and again, I don't have time to go back and teach the principles of the Godhead. But we need to understand that we're not dealing with Jesus being on earth and ascending to heaven and sending a different person back to earth to live inside of us. But here's what he said. He said, I'm going to pray that there is another comforter that comes to you. And then he says in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So who is the comforter? Jesus says, he said, I'm the one that's going to come back and comfort you. I am that comforter. But when he came back, he did not come back in fleshly form as he had come the first time. He came back to us as the spirit of a departed one, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, we know John 4 and 24 tells us that God is a spirit. Read. God is a spirit. 
God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. This, this is the truth. biggest problem with today's theology is that they try to make God into persons. But Jesus himself said, no, no, no. God's not a person. God is a spirit. He's a spirit. He's a spirit. Amen. God is a spirit. We know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is a spirit. And in fact, what does the Bible say? Galatians chapter, Galatians, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter four, verse six. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. The spirit. Now look at this. The spirit of whom? The spirit of his son into your hearts. Crying, Abba, Father. So who's inside of us? Hallelujah. It is Jesus. There, there are not three persons in the Godhead. Amen. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is a spirit. God is a spirit. It is the spirit of Christ. And yet Ephesians 4 and 4 tells us this. There is one body. There is one body and, one and there's only one spirit. one spirit, not three spirits, but there is one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. I'm here to proclaim to you amen, the ancient message of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Right. Amen. He's only one. He's not three. Right. Amen. And again, I, I, I keep saying I don't have time to reteach this, and yet... Here I go. Amen. I'm trying to get off and, and, and just deal strictly with the Holy Ghost this morning. But, but let me just say this, because the question comes up, well, then why does the Bible make mention of the Father and make mention of the Son, make mention of the Holy Ghost? And, and we've got to understand that these are terms of relationship. When I, when I teach in Africa, when I teach those pastors, I, I, I explain to them that, you know, I am... Um, over there, I use the title bishop because it, it means something in particular to them. Um, and, and I fit that definition in their eyes. And so that's to them, that's, I'm not just pastor, I'm bishop there. So I, I tell them I am a bishop and I am a husband. But, but you've got to understand when I come home in the afternoon, I don't sit down in my recliner and say to my wife, your bishop would like something to drink. And I don't stand behind this pulpit and say to the church, your husband is preaching to you. Those titles, those terms describe a particular relationship that I have. I'm not your husband. I'm your bishop. I'm your pastor. Right? To my wife, I am her husband. And so there is a difference. I use a different term based on the relationship that I am fulfilling at that moment. Hallelujah. And God is our father in that he created us. He created all things. He is our father. He was the son because he was born of a virgin. And we look at the son and we understand we're dealing there with his humanity. We're dealing with the life he lived here on this earth when we talk about the son. And when we talk about the Holy Ghost, we're talking about the spirit of that son that has departed and now dwells on the inside of us. Not three separate persons, but three different roles of relationship with us. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about for a little while here today. The Holy Ghost. Let's, let's understand first of all that this is an experience that was promised to us. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter two, verses 38 and 39. Amen. And, and, and let me preface this by just reminding everyone. Acts chapter two 
gives us the story of the birth of the New Testament church. There was no church prior to Acts 2. The church as we know it did not exist until Acts chapter 2. And and so prior to Acts chapter 2, anybody that was quote unquote saved was not saved in the church. The thief on the cross was not saved in the church. The church did not begin until Pentecost. And so in Acts chapter 2, we find a group of hungry souls asking the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is the very first time that we encounter sinners asking how to be saved after the birth of the church. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe in this series somewhere I'll come along and teach a lesson on, on proper Bible interpretation. It's important that we know how to rightly divide the scripture. And so, you know, maybe I should have begun with that, but we may throw that in somewhere along the way. But one of the important things that we need to understand about Bible interpretation is what we call the law or principle of first mention. The first time that something is mentioned in scripture, it carries a great significance and generally provides much more detail than other uh, subsequent mentions such as the story of creation. We read about God creating the earth many times throughout Scripture. We read references to the fact that God created the earth, but we don't read the details of creation except in the first mention. We know that God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. We know what he created. We know he created light and darkness on the first day. We know that he created man and the animals on the sixth day. We know exactly what God did on each day of creation, but only because of the details that were provided in Genesis chapter 1. The details are given there and nowhere else. Now, when we read about God creating the world in other passages, just because it doesn't say he did it in six days does not negate the fact that he did it in six days. Just because some other reference to creation does not specify that God created man on the sixth day does not change the fact that he created man on the sixth day. You understand? Every other reference after the first mention expects you to just accept as truth what the first mention told us. And so what we have in Acts chapter 2 verses 38 and 39 is the first mention of the explanation of what it takes to be saved. This is the first time after the birth of the church that sinners ask how to be saved. And so any other mention after Acts 2 may not list all these details, but it doesn't change these details. You're expected to believe and accept these details regardless of whether they're listed or not. When Paul told the Philippian jailer to believe on the Lord, you can't just take that scripture and throw away everything that led up to that point. You've got to understand that this was the beginning of Paul's message, not the entirety of his message. Because in fact, that that passage even goes on to say that Paul preached the word of the Lord to him and the same hour of the night, the jailer took him and and was baptized of him. So there was much more that Paul preached that night, not just believe. We got to go back to the first mention. And that's what we find in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, the first mention of how to be saved in the church age. So let's read it. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you... Shall. Everyone say shall. Now, now look, the, the question that was asked was, men and brethren, maybe we should have backed up and read verse 37. But if you're following along in your Bible, you can see it there that, that when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We've sinned. We've crucified the Messiah. How are we going to deal with this sin in our life? What shall we do? 
And the answer to what shall we do? Everyone say shall. What shall we do? The answer is right here. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the answer. Now, in order to receive that, there are some prerequisites. Here's what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And then, this is the answer. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse number 39 says this. For the promise. For this promise. Everyone say promise. This is a promise. This promise is unto you and to your children and to, your children, and to, all, and to that are all that are afar off, even as, even the as many God as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. The answer to the sin question is this. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the way you deal with it. Because God's not just interested in dealing with past sin. He wants to empower us to deal with the present temptation. So the answer is not just I need forgiveness for what I did. It's I need help going forward. And the help that comes is through the power of the Holy Ghost. This is a promise. Now, it's important that we understand this word promise because this promise had been foretold. In fact, it was commanded by Jesus that the apostles were to preach this promise. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Now, Luke 24 is the... um it, it's it's the last words of the Lord prior to his ascension into heaven. He is he's going away. He is he is going to be ascending into heaven and the work of building a church and continuing this message for which the Lord has died was buried and resurrected is now going to be in the hands of his apostles. And so he then gathers them together for one last meeting and, and make sure that they understand. In fact, he even in one place here in, in Luke chapter 24, uh, we didn't put it in the notes to be read, but the Bible makes it clear that that Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's in verse 45 of Luke 24. Uh, Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So there's no way that anyone will ever convince me that the apostles made a mistake. They did not make a mistake and they did not misunderstand. Jesus himself opened their understanding, all right? He opened their understanding. And then, after opening their understanding, he gives them a command that these are the things I want you to preach. All right, let's turn to Luke 24. And let's read it now in Luke 24, uh, verses 46 through 49. Uh, in fact, if you don't mind, can you back up to verse 45? I, I, uh, I know we've got a... A uh, substitute working our sound booth today, but he's doing a great job. And uh, verse 45, if you could back up for me there, Luke 24 and 45, just so you can see this, that Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So there's no question about the apostles understanding. It's clear there was a divine impartation that took place. So whatever Jesus is about to tell them, they understood what he meant. Their minds are clear. They may have misunderstood things for the three and a half years that he he was with them and taught them. They may not have clearly understood all the parables prior to this moment. But at this moment, there's no misunderstanding. There's only clarity. Jesus opened their understanding so that they might understand the scriptures now verse 46 he said to them he said unto them thus it is written, thus it's written thus it behooved thus it christ, behoved to, christ suffer to suffer and to rise from the, the dead, dead the third, third day, day and that and that now watch this here's what he says and i want you to notice 
in the middle of this verse should be preached. Everyone say should be preached. So I want you to understand that what he is about to tell them in this verse and the subsequent verses, he's about to tell them what should be preached. That repentance. Right. Mission of sin. Wait, hang on just a minute. Everybody understand that. that, that what he's about to tell them is what should be preached. So what should be preached? First of all, Repen- repentance. repentance, repentance. Everyone say repentance. Repentance should be preached. All right. And what else? And remission of sin. Remission of sins. Should be preached in his name. In his name. Everyone say remission of sins in his name. That should be preached. Among all nations. Among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem and ye are witnesses, and you're witnesses of these things. And behold. And behold. I send the promise, of my, the promise of my father. Everyone say the promise of my father. I send the promise of my father upon you. But, but tear ye, tear ye in the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Until you be, until you be endued with power from on high. And so, so Jesus told his apostles. There are three things that should be preached. Now, I hope that you noticed nowhere in these three things did he say preach except the Lord as your personal Savior. It's not there. In fact, not only is it not there, it's not anywhere. There's nowhere in the scripture that that term is even used. Jesus said what should be preached is not acceptance, it's repentance and remission of sins in his name and the promise of the Father. These are the things that they were commanded to preach. Amen. Now, now let me, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a little off the, 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 the list here for just a moment, Brother Jerome, and I apologize to you. I, I want to make it as easy on you as I can, but but you do understand that Luke, Luke, uh, has written his gospel here, Luke 24. When you go to the book of Acts, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And many people call Acts Luke 2. Or 2nd Luke. Because when you read Luke 24, the way it ends is the way Acts 1 begins. Luke picks up where he left off. It is the sequel to his gospel. Is everybody with me? Two of you are with me. Let me try this again. The book of Acts is the sequel to the gospel of Luke. The book of Acts picks up where Luke left off and tells the same story by the same author. It just goes farther. In Luke... He told the story of Jesus. In Acts, he told the story of Jesus' followers. All right? It's just a continual story. And so in Luke 24, he says, I want you to preach the promise of my father. Now, when we get to Acts chapter 1, this is not in your notes, so you're going to have to get this from your Bible. Acts chapter 1, read verses 4 and 5 for me. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with, being assembled them, together with them, commanded them, commanded that they them. should not depart from Jerusalem. All right, now, 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 now hang on just a minute. This is what we just read in Luke 24. This is what we just read in Luke 24. He was assembled together with them, telling them, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem to be endured powerful on high. So now Luke, the same writer, is telling the same story. He's picking up at that point. Does everybody see that? And and he says he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but what? Wait for the Wait promise. for the Here's this term again. Luke used it in Luke 24. He used this term Jesus commanded preach the promise of the Father, and now in Acts chapter 1 same author uses the same term. He said wait for the promise of the Father. Which saith he, you have heard of me, me, read, for John truly baptized with water. 
But ye shall but be baptized, you shall be Holy baptized Ghost. with the Holy Ghost, not many days, not many days hence. hence. So we see immediately that the promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right. Luke explained that for us. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to debate it. Luke, the author, explained it. Hallelujah. When he told us the first time, he simply said, this is what Jesus said for the apostles to preach. When he picks up his second book, begins to write, he then tells us, now let me explain to you what Jesus meant by that. He said, go and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. He said, John baptized with water, but there's another baptism that's coming in not very many days. And that baptism is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is the promise of the Father. That's the promise that God wants every one of us to receive. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. You see, God had laid out very clearly in great detail exactly how he wanted his people to live. 600 plus commandments in the Old Testament made it very clear. This is what I expect out of you. Problem was that for centuries, the Jews couldn't do it. Now, you know, I mean, there there were many times in their life they didn't want to do it. But there were other times when they would repent and they wanted to do it and they still messed up. And so they'd have to go and offer sacrifices and give offerings and try to take care of the problems. And God knew that. God knew that in their own carnal flesh, they would never be able to live a life pleasing to him. And yet hear me. Because this is something that gets so misconstrued in in so much of the church world today. People think that now in the New Testament time, God doesn't care how you live. And that's not true. The whole promise of the father was because he does care about how we live. The reason he wanted to give this promise was because he knew. We couldn't be what he wanted us to be on our own. We needed empowerment. We needed to be endued with power from on high. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and and verses 31 through 33. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 33. Jesus, I'm sorry, uh, the spirit of God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. And, and here's what he's saying to his people. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 33. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. Now, with the, now, now listen to this. Listen to this. God said the day is coming. I'm going to give you a new covenant. You, you understand the, the word covenant here. We could also say a new testament. Same thing. I've, I've, I've issued my covenant with Abraham. I've issued my covenant and I'm going to give you a new covenant. I'm, I'm going to give you a new testament. There's going to be a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Read about this new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made. It's not going to be like the covenant I made with your fathers. The day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant, which they, my break, covenant they break. Although I, although was, I was a husband, and husband unto them, them saith the, the Lord. But this shall be the covenant but that I this is the, the covenant that I'm going to make with the house of Israel. After those After days, those saith, days the Lord, saith the Lord, I my law I'm going to put my law in their inward parts. And, write it in their and I'm going to write it in their hearts. And, will be their and I'll be their God. They be and they'll be my people. Do you, look, I, I want to make sure you're understanding what I'm telling you right now. The promise of God was this. I'm going to write a new covenant. I still want you living to please me. 
But I understand that having the rules on tables of stone does not get the job done. I'm not going to erase the rules, but I'm going to write them somewhere different. I'm not going to put them on tables of stone for Moses to carry down and read to you. But what I am going to do, I'm going to write them on the table of your heart. And I'm going to do something on the inside of you that's going to cause you to want to be what I want you to be. I'm going to change the desires that you have. Right now, I understand, fallen man, you desire to sin. You desire to do things wrong. You desire to pursue carnality and, and lustly, uh, 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 lustful things. You desire to do what's wrong. But I want to change all of that. And I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. And I'm going to take that law and I'm going to write it. On the inside. Now, again, this is not in the notes, and I apologize ahead of time. But, but, but let's let's let me let me just confirm this out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Go to Ezekiel chapter thirty-six, Ezekiel chapter thirty-six, and and uh, verses twenty-six and twenty-seven. Um, and, I, and I apologize that it's not in the notes, but but it is what it is. Let me just confirm to you, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, re- read for me here. From the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter number 36, verses 26 and 27. Read for me. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Okay. And I will hang, take... Hang on, hang on just a minute. Let's, let's, let's let him... I've, I've sprung this on him, so I want to give him a chance to get it up here on the wall so everyone can follow along. This is Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. All right. Let's, no, this is uh, verse 26. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. There we go. All right. Now read. A new heart also will I give you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new, and spirit, a new will spirit will I put within you. And I will take, and away, I will the take away the stony heart out of your flesh, of your flesh. And, I will give and I will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27. And I will put my spirit, and I will you put my spirit within you and cause you. And cause you. Look at this. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and and you shall keep my judgments and do that. Does everyone see? This is why we call it the Holy Spirit. This is why we call it the Holy Ghost because it is God's Spirit dwelling on the inside of us, causing us to walk in His statutes, to keep His judgments, to do the things He wants us to do. The Holy Spirit is not come just so we can feel a few goosebumps once in a while or or, or talk in tongues or whatever and, and then keep living the way we've always lived. No, no, no. But the Holy Spirit has come because God has some things he wants from us and the only way it's ever going to happen is if we have the power of that spirit of holiness living on the inside of us. Amen. Well, hallelujah. I'm telling you, something happens when you receive the Holy Ghost. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. That's why when people tell me I could never live like that, I could never live like that. Well, I want to tell you something. I can't either. But he can. And if he's living inside of me, then he can live this life through me. Well, hallelujah. Amen. The, the, the problem is not whether or not God can do this. It's whether or not we'll allow God to do it. That's true. If we'll let him to do the living, then I'm telling you, the old things are passed away. And the things that I used to hate, I now love. And the things I used to love, I now hate. God has made a total transformation. God has completely turned my life around. God has made me into something I never was before. Hallelujah. 
And it's not because of me. And it's not because of my goodness. And it's not because of my ability. But it's because his spirit's on the inside of me. And hear me, as we start, as we start struggling more and more that, oh man, this thing's really pulling on me. This, this sin, this temptation's really strong on me. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. We need to go back and get some more Holy Ghost. We need to go back and get some more Holy Ghost. We need to let God fill us up again. Hallelujah. Hey, God, there's a part of my heart that hadn't been transformed yet. There's a part of my heart that's still longing for those old things. I need you to come and change all of that. I need you to come and transform all of that. I see some weaknesses in me that I don't like. And God, you're the only one that can make this transformation. That's, that's why, that's why I've said, and I, I said it, I said it, uh, uh last week. I, I say, I, I say it, amen, that, that you don't need to go for weeks and weeks and weeks without praying through to the Holy Ghost. You need to do it regularly. The more you can stay full of the Holy Ghost, the more you can become what God wants you to be. The more that you can stay full of the Holy Ghost, the more you can live the kind of life God wants you to live. And hear me, that's not legalism. Legalism is what the Jews experienced when they had a list of rules. I'm not living by a list of written rules. I'm living by what's in my heart. Can I tell you, I don't want to drink alcohol. I don't want to smoke cigarettes. I don't want to go to ungodly places. I don't want to listen to ungodly stories. There's something that's happened on the inside of me that my desires have been transformed. And when you are struggling with those things, the answer is you need more Holy Ghost control in your life. Hallelujah. It's the power of God. He said, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. And it's not going to be just any spirit. And it's not going to be the spirit of the third person. God said, I'm going to put my spirit on the inside of you. That's what you're going to have. That's the new covenant that I'm writing. Oh, hallelujah. That's what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. Is I'm going to come down and institute a brand new way of living. Hallelujah. I'm going to give to man something they've never had so they can be what I want them to be. Well, hallelujah. Let's get back. To, let's get back to my notes here. Um, Second Corinthians chapter three, verse three, the apostle Paul makes, makes reference to this. Um, second Corinthians three, verse three. For as much as you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. You are manifestly de- declared to be the epistle of Christ. Ministered by us. Ministered by us. But not written with not with ink. But with the spirit but of the with the God. spirit of the living God, not in tables, not in tables of stone, but in, fleshy tables but in of the, the heart. fleshy tables of the heart. Here's what he said. He said, everybody that sees you recognizes you are a letter. That's what epistle means. You are a letter from Christ. When they see you, they're going to recognize this is a letter from Christ. You want to know why they're going to recognize it? Not because you look like everybody else and act like everybody else, but you just got a cross hanging around your neck or you got a fish on the back of your car. That's not what it's all about. But they're going to be able to look at you and see those people are different. They don't act like everybody else. They don't talk like everybody else. They don't think like everybody else. There's something different about them. What is it? It's not that I'm better than anybody, but I'll tell you what it is. God has written his love letter on the inside of me. He's put something down in my spirit. God has made a transformation through the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's not about... These stone tablets, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, there's times, Brother Hilton, when, when, when I'm not, now look, the, the, 
I don't, I don't want to be misunderstood because the scripture does bring conviction. When I'm reading the scripture and I see things there that, that I, I said, man, I need to change this in my life. I, I, I see that it, scripture does, but there's just times I'm, I'm not even reading scripture. I'm just doing something. Boy, all of a sudden something prompts me says, you know, I don't feel good about this. What is that? What is that? That's that spirit of God inside of me. That's the spirit of God dwelling on the inside that's trying to change me into his image. Do you understand? He became what we are so we could become like he is. That's the whole, not so we could go to heaven, still sinners. I'm telling you, please, 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 to our guests, I, 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 well, I don't want to say this is unusual for me because I don't, I don't know what is usual for me. I don't know what's, I don't know what's normal for me. But anyhow, uh, it may seem like I'm on a bit of a tirade today. I'm, I'm really not. I'm feeling good in my spirit. I just trying to clarify some things, trying to make some things clear here today for everybody to understand amen what's 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 going on there is something that happens the power of the spirit that comes into our life that transforms our way of thinking it just changes it changes who we are what we are what we want what we desire how we live how we act how we talk it changes everything he wants to perfect his image in us he wants to make us I started to say this and, 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 and got sidetracked but it may just be a matter of semantics and and so I, you know I don't want to be overly critical but 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 I understand the meaning behind uh, what people say when they say this and 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 we have to remember words do mean things there are meanings behind the things that we say. And so I, I actually heard a preacher say one time, well, you know, there's only two kinds of people in the world. And, and, and he said, but they're all sinners. You're either lost sinners or you're saved sinners. Everybody's a sinner. Well, you know, I, in one sense, I could agree that I was a sinner who is now saved. But to use the term, I am a saved sinner. I don't like that. Because the word sinner means one who is living in sin. And when you're saved, you're not supposed to keep living in sin. Get for me Romans chapter 6. I This is not in the notes. It's not in the notes, but it's in my heart today. But get for me Romans chapter 6. Look, look, we gotta understand. We, we've got a wrong picture of what it means to be saved. We've got this idea that, that in fact, you know, yesterday, well, I don't even want to get into it, but anyhow, we, we, we've got this idea that you just accept Christ and you just keep on living like you want to live. You can, you can cuss, you can drink, you can carry on, you can carouse, doesn't matter. You've accepted Christ. You're forever saved. Nothing you can do about it. Can't be lost if you want to. You just, you're, you're in, you're good. And that's so contrary to what the Bible teaches. Amen. New Testament, New Testament, Romans chapter six and verse number one says this. What shall we say? What shall we say then? Shall we shall continue, we in, continue sin? in sin grace that abound. grace may abound? Here's the question. We're living in the in the age of grace. This is the age of grace. You're ta- trying to put people under the law. No, I'm not. This is what Paul said about grace. Should we just keep on sinning so grace can cover for us? What was his answer? God forbid. God forbid. God forbid that we live a life where we say, well, grace is just going to cover me. Grace is just going to cover me. I'll just keep on sinning. Grace is going to cover me. No, God forbid, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In fact, I'm, I'm out of my notes and that gets dangerous, but I think, uh, what does verse 14 say? Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. What, what does it say? For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
for you are not under the law, but under grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one I want. Look at this. Sin shall not have dominion under you, over you, because, because you're not under the law, but under grace. People have got it so twisted. Sin had dominion over the legalists. That's why they had to have law. Because sin reigned in their life. And the only thing that kept some of them from sinning was the law. But now grace has done something totally different in our lives. And grace doesn't cover our sin. Grace frees us from sin. Jesus did not come to save us in our sin. He came to save us from our sin. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. I dealt with this the other night when I was teaching uh, a week or so ago. I, 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 I dealt with uh, what grace does and how grace teaches us. Grace teaches us that we ought to deny ungodly lust. Grace teaches us that we ought to live uh, soberly, righteously, and soberly and godly in this present world. Grace does not give us a license to sin. Grace gives us the ability to live above sin. You say, well, I'm still struggling. I'm still fighting. Well, you need more grace. How does that grace come? It's going to come through the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not off my notes today. I'm telling you, there's a reason why it's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Praise God. So Paul said, he said, you are the epistle of Christ. You've been written not with ink and not on tables of stone, but it's in the fleshy tables of the heart. The Lord has made a transformation by putting these laws into you. And his spirit that's dwelling on the inside of you causes you to want to live this way. Well, praise God. It makes you want to please God. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I'm, 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 even though I'm reading some of the scriptures in my notes, I'm not really going the direction my notes were designed to go. Amen. But let me, let me just, let me just tell you, let me just tell you that it is the plan and purpose of God that you receive this glorious experience called the Holy Ghost. In fact, I'm going to have to come back. I don't, I don't have time to really develop uh, uh, some of these things that I want to touch on right now. I don't really have the time, but, but let's, let's skip ahead a little bit. Go over to Romans chapter eight and verse number nine. That's in the list, uh, there somewhere. Romans chapter eight and verse nine. I want to show you something. But you're not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. Romans eight chapter nine, uh, chapter eight verse nine. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, but in the spirit. If so be, if so be that the Spirit of that God, the Spirit dwell, of in God, God dwell in you. Now, if any man, now, if any man the have Christ, not the Spirit of Christ, he, he is, none, is of none of his. Uh, first of all, notice how he interchangeably uses Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ. There's no difference here. Amen. He said, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. If... The Spirit of God is dwelling in you. And then he said, now, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ. So it's not two different spirits. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then he said, you're none of his. You're none of his. Amen. I, I, I said this I said this the other night um, when, when I was teaching. But this whole message, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is, is the foundation of everything that we believe. And, and the reason why we say you have to have the Holy Ghost is because the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't have the Spirit of God. Christ is not living in you if the Holy Ghost is not there. 
No matter what you believe, no matter what you profess, no matter what you have accepted, if the Holy Ghost is not dwelling in you, then the Spirit of God is not in you. And without the Spirit of God, you are none of His. You don't belong to Him. You, you just don't belong to Him. Jesus said this, John chapter 3 verse 5, and I've, I've skipped a lot here, but but um, John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered. Jesus answered. Verily, verily. Verily, verily. I say, I unto, say thee, unto thee. Except a man, except be, born a man be born of water. And of the spirit. And of the spirit. He cannot. He. Wait a minute. He. Cannot. He. Cannot. He. Cannot. Jesus is the one who said this. Jesus said he cannot enter, into the, enter into the kingdom of God unless you are born of the spirit. You also have to be born of water. And, and it's clear. We've read it. We've dealt with it. We've already talked about it. Jesus commanded his apostles to preach remission of sins in his name. Beginning at Jerusalem, Peter preached that when he said, you've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Jesus uh, specified water and spirit when he told the apostles in Acts chapter 1, John's baptized you with water, but now you got to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. There is there is a, a necessity that you are born of water and of the spirit. And without that spirit birth, Jesus said you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now just because you believe does not mean you've got the Holy Ghost. I am all over the place this morning, but go to, go to Acts chapter 10. It's not in your notes again. Acts, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. This is not in the notes, but here we are. Acts chapter 19. Um, let's just start with verse number one. Acts chapter 19 and verse one. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth. It, it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth. Paul having Paul passed, having passed the to the upper coast, coast came, to came to Ephesus and finding Find certain disciples, he said unto them, yeah. have, you have you received the Holy Ghost? Since you believed. Since you believed. Now, it, it depends on what translation you're reading from. That some versions say, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe? I don't care how the translation reads. The point is this. Just because you believe does not mean you have it. These people were obviously believers, but they didn't have it. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, they said unto him we, have not so much we haven't even heard there be any Holy that there is a Holy Ghost. He said unto them, and he said to them, unto what, unto then, what were then were you baptized? And they Isn't said, it interesting? There's two things that Paul wants to know about. Isn't it interesting? There's two things Paul wants to know. Jesus said you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born of water and born of the spirit. And Paul wants to know these two things about these believers. Have you been born of the water and have you been born of the spirit? You may be a believer, but that doesn't mean you've been born again. You got to be born of water and you got to be born of the spirit. And what does it mean to be born of water? He said, under what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. We've already been baptized. We've already been baptized. We were baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus said that among women, there's none greater that's ever been born outside of John the Baptist. The greatest of all of the prophets that were born of women was John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. And John the Baptist is the one who baptized these people. But that baptism was not good enough. They had not been born of water. Why? Let's read on. We were baptized by John the Baptist. Read on. Then said Paul, then said Paul John, verily John verily baptized, baptized with, the with a baptism of repentance, of repentance saying, unto saying to the people that they, they got to believe, believe on, him, on the one that's come coming after, after John. That is, on, that is Christ. on Christ Jesus. In fact, when Paul began to refer back to John, you know what it was that John had preached? John had preached, there's one coming after me that's mightier than I. The laces of whose shoes I'm not even worthy to unlatch. Ah, he said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I may baptize you with water, but there's a greater baptism that's coming. And what happened?
happened? Verse number five. When they heard this, they were what? Wait a minute. When they heard this, they were what? They were what? They'd already been baptized by John the Baptist, but they had not been born of water because it was not done in his name as Jesus had commanded. And so when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But it's not finished yet. They've been born of water, but there's something else that's got to happen. So read on. And when Paul, and when laid Paul had them, laid his hands upon the them, on the them. Holy Ghost came on them, and, and they tongues. spake with tongues and prophesied. Now they've been born of water, and they've been born of the Spirit. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Here's 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 what here, here's what I'm I'm trying to get across to you this morning. You, you got you got two things you got to deal with. You gotta deal with the sins you've already committed. You gotta deal with what you have been up to this point. But that's not enough because if you don't get something else, you're gonna just keep on doing what you've always done. And so you gotta deal with from this point forward. And I'm telling you that in repentance, you're asking God to forgive you of all that old stuff. But when you get baptized in Jesus' name, that's when you receive the remission of those sins. And so what happens, you've repented, you've been baptized, you've dealt with your past. The past is taken care of. The past is off the record. In God's book, it doesn't exist anymore. But that doesn't take care of today and tomorrow and next week and next month. And so you not only have to repent and be baptized, but you've got to receive the Holy Ghost because that's where you're going to, re- you're going to receive the power to quit living the way you've always lived. Hallelujah. You, you got to, you, you got to receive this glorious gift in order to make the necessary change. Look, um, Romans 8, 14. My, my time's almost up. Sister Becky, you better come and start playing. I, I want to have enough time for some folks to pray. They want the Holy Ghost. I, I got a lot more ground to cover. I'm, I'm only on page three out of seven pages of notes. I'm not even halfway done. So we're not going to get done today, but that's all right. Uh, and I've skipped quite a bit. But Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says this. For as many as are as many as are led by what? By what? As many as are led by the Spirit of God. They They are are the sons of God. God. Well, I'm a child of God. Are you? Are you letting the Spirit of God lead you? I can tell you this, the Spirit of God is not going to lead you into a bar. The Spirit of God is not going to lead you into a a lot of places. <laughs> right. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, that's when you are the sons of God. When you're led by the Spirit. I'm telling you, this is why you need the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is going to lead you. The Holy Ghost is going to guide you. The Holy Ghost is going to keep you. Oh, let's get a few more of these scriptures very quickly. First John chapter three, verse 24. And he that keepeth this is New Testament. This is New Testament. This is New Testament. First John three, verse 24. Hallelujah. Where are we? First John three, verse 24. Here we go. Read. And he that he that keepeth, keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him dwelleth in him and he, and he in him and hereby, and hereby we know, we that, know we that he abideth in us by the, by the spirit, spirit which, he which he's given. given us. Do you understand what he just said? John just said, "This is the way we know the Spirit's still with you if you're keeping his commandments. If you're doing what he tells you to do, then we know the Spirit's still in you. But the moment that you start desiring to go back the other direction, it's time to come back to the altar and say, Lord, I need you to." fill me up again. I need some more of that Holy Ghost working in my life. I got to start following after you again. I got to start pleasing you again. 
Oh, hallelujah. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. 1 John 4, 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. This is how we know that we dwell in Him, because He's given us of His Spirit. Praise God. Amen. Just one more verse, and I am closing for today. Amen. And and this is Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans 8 and verse 11 says this. If the Spirit of if Him, the spirit of him that Jesus raised dead, up Jesus from the dead dwell in, dwell you. in you, he that raised, he up, that Christ raised up Christ from the dead shall also so quicken your mortal by bodies his by his well spirit. I'm telling you, the only way we're getting up out of the ground when the trumpet sounds is if that same spirit's dwelling on the inside of us. We got to be full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On that great getting up morning. Amen. When that trumpet sounds and the dead start awakening, the only way that we're going up with them is if that spirit is dwelling on the inside of us. Oh, hallelujah. This is how we know we're his children because his spirit's on the inside. He's coming back for his children. He's coming back for those that are full of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you something, my friend. You may be a good person. You may be religious. You may, you, you, you may, you may have all of these things, amen, to your credit. And I'm not discounting them and I'm not in any way trying to besmirch them, but I'm just telling you, that in itself is not enough to get you up out of here when the trumpet sounds. The only thing that's going to get you out of here is if the Spirit of God's dwelling on the inside of you. You got to have the Holy Ghost and the fire, that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. Hallelujah. It's that kind of religion that you can't conceal. It makes you move and shout and cry. It's real. I got my hand right in that winding chain and my soul has been anchored in my Jesus name. I've been filled with it. I've been born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm telling you, you got to have the Holy Ghost. If you're here this morning, let's stand, everybody. If you're here this morning, you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost. God wants to give it to you today. God wants you to have this glorious experience. God wants you to have this glorious experience for yourself. Amen. It's available for the promises to you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This promise is yours if you want it today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. These altars are open. Amen. Maybe somebody here just decides. Amen. Just realizes, recognizes. uh, I need a little more holy. Ghost. I need God to fill me up anew and afresh today. That really ought to be every one of us. I want a fresh baptism. I want a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. These altars are open this morning. Let's come. Let's spend a little bit of time in prayer. And if you have never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, it can be yours today. God wants to give it to you. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, everyone. God to have the Holy Ghost and the fire that burning thee. Keeps the prayer will turn the kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, move shout, cry. It's, it's real. I got my head right in the wine and chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them, free from sin. I've been born again. You got to have the Holy Ghost and the fire. Is that burning thing that keeps the prayer with her in the kind of religion? Kind of religion. You, you cannot, cannot conceal it, makes you move, shout, cry. It's real. Well, I got my hand in the wine and chain, and my soul been anchored in my Jesus' name, and I'm filled with them, free from sin. I've been born again. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. Fire is that burning thing that keeps the prayer with her in the kind of religion. Of religion. You it cannot conceal it, makes you move, shout, cry. It's real. Well, I got my hand in the wine and chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus' name, and I'm filled with them, free from sin. I've 
been born again. You got to have a Holy You must Ghost have that Holy Ghost fire, fire, that burning thing that keeps, keeps the prayer wheel turning. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my hair right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. I'm free from sin. I've been born again. You must have that Holy Ghost fire, that burning theme that keeps the prayer wheel turning. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my hand right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. Free from sin, I've been born again. You must have that Holy Ghost fire, that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my hand right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. I'm free from sin. I've been born again. You must have that Holy Ghost fire, that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my hand right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. I'm free from sin. I've been born. Again, you got to have, have the Holy Ghost, Ghost and the fire as that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. That kind of religion you cannot conceal it, makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my head right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them, free from sin. I've been born. Again, you got to have, have the Holy Ghost and the fire, that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. The kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. Well, I got my head right in the winding chain, and my soul been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. I'm free from sin. I've been born again. You must have that Holy Ghost fire, that burning thing that keeps the prayer wheel turning. Kind of religion you cannot conceal. It makes you move, makes you shout, makes you cry. It's real. I got my hand right in the winding chain, and my soul's been anchored in my Jesus name, and I'm filled with them. I'm free from sin. I've been born again. Hallelujah. Come on, let's love him, everybody. Let's love him. Let's love him. Ah, hallelujah. 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 I'm glad I got the Holy Ghost this morning. I said, I'm glad I've got the Holy Ghost this morning. Oh, yeah, I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible said. I've been to the water. I've been baptized. Well, praise God. Thank God. Thank God. If you don't have it, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. Greatest gift God is giving away today gift of the Holy Ghost transforming power of the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us. Amen. God bless you this morning. Service tonight. We want to come early. We want to be here to pray no later than 530. No later than 530. We want to come in and start praying. We want to have a move of God tonight. Amen. I want to see the Holy Ghost 
poured out. I want to see somebody receive the Holy Ghost tonight. I'd love to see somebody baptized in Jesus' name before we leave this place tonight. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. Why don't you invite somebody? Why don't you tell them we're having a special service tonight? Free food. That ought to draw a crowd, huh? Praise God. Amen. Well, free refreshments. And I heard somebody say cookies. That ought to, that ought to bring out somebody somewhere. Amen. Tonight, tonight, Brother Brandon Hilton will be preaching the service tonight. We're looking forward to it. He did a great job when he preached the other night. What a tremendous message he preached. I'm really looking forward to uh, tonight's service and expecting great, great things to happen in the service tonight. Praise God. Amen. Ladies, don't forget the things that my wife has asked you to bring for this time of fellowship after the service. God bless you. Greet one another in the fear of God. You are dismissed in Jesus' name.